Thanks, Travis. Hey, uh, so I wasn't a journalism major, but it, it, there's an expression, don't bury the lead. So Travis mentioned a number. He said that we'd planted 19 churches, and I don't want to bury the lead. That's 19 churches this year in 2022. That's not over the <laughs> lifetime of our church. So that, that's this year. Thank you so much for your generosity and, and thanks for giving so that we could invest in churches around the world to reach people. But I'm convinced that the church that shines the farthest shines the brightest at home. Last week, we celebrated seeing uh, 30 people come to faith in Christ. 29 of those were at our vacation Bible school here on this campus. And this week, we celebrate 14 people who came to faith in Christ. And 10 of those were kids at our vacation Bible school at the Wildwood campus. So our God is on the move. We've seen um, as many evangelists, those are people who have led someone to faith in Christ. We've seen as many evangelists so far this year through the first six months of the year as we saw all of last year. And so God's working. He's working in you to make it possible for you to break the sound barrier, plant the Jesus flag, and invite people to respond to the good news of the gospel. So thank you. Thank you for your generosity that's leading to new churches. Thank you for your willingness and your boldness to share the gospel. Now, what would the gospel do in us? What could it do? What could it do in our, in our marriages? What could it do in our families? What could it do in the marketplace? That's what we're going to be looking at this morning and next week and, and the following week. We're going to see what the book of Colossians teaches about the, the power of the gospel to transform our marriages and our parenting and our life in the marketplace. And we all need the gospel. So turn to Colossians chapter 3, and I'm going to read verses 18 and 19. So I invite you to turn there in your Bibles and if you don't have a Bible with you, you can follow along on the screens. This is God's word to us, so let's, let's pay close attention. Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Let's pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Father, by your word you spoke and, and all of creation came into being. And Jesus, you are the living word who took on our flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld your glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And Holy Spirit, you're the one who guides us in the word. So I pray that you would take the word and press it into our hearts this morning. Let the word be like a seed that bears fruit, 30, 60, 100 fold. May it bear fruit in marriages this morning and may it bear fruit in lives transformed by the power of the gospel. Help all who hear and help the one who speaks. For I pray in Jesus name. Amen. Hey, if, if you could uh, play one part in a motion picture, what would it be? Just one part, one scene, one character in a motion picture, what would it be? I've got three. The first one is Jack Nicholson in A Few Good Men, Colonel Jessup, You Can't Handle the Truth, you don't want the truth because deep down in places you don't like to talk about at parties, you want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. We use words like honor, code, loyalty. We use these words as the backbone of a life spent defending something. You use them as a punchline. That would have been fun, right? Now, Russell Crowe and Gladiator... This is a great speech. My name is Maximus Decimus Meridius, commander of the armies of the north, general of the Felix legions, and loyal servant to the true emperor. 
Marcus Aurelius, father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife, and I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. Oh, it's so good. But this is maybe the best one. And I, I, I may literally, I might cry as I read this one. This one's so good. Mel Gibson in Braveheart. William Wallace. Run and you'll live at least a while. And dying in your beds many years from now, would you be willing to trade all the days from this day to that for one chance, just one chance to come back here and tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. Yes. Oh, it's so good. Wow. Great parts. Great scenes. Great speeches. If you could play one person what would you play? Listen, in marriage, you get to play the best part. Listen, if you're a wife, you get to play the best part. You get to play Jesus. And listen, if you're a husband, you get to play the best part. You get to play Jesus. If you're a wife, you get to play Jesus. You get to lovingly, voluntarily submit to your husband, just like Jesus, who voluntarily, for your salvation and for mine, voluntarily submitted himself to the will of the Father. In the Garden of Gethsemane, in, in Luke chapter 22, we, we hear Jesus in the Garden saying, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will be done. If you're a wife, you get to play the part of Jesus, to voluntarily submit yourself like Jesus did for you, because Jesus did for you. And listen, if you're a husband, then, then you get to lovingly, sacrificially, serve your wife, just like Jesus did. You get to play the part of Jesus. You get to do what Jesus did. Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You get to play the part of Jesus, wives and husbands. We all get to play Jesus. What could be better than that? Now, well, this morning, we're going to learn what a gospel-centered marriage looks like. Now, there's a few things I want us to keep in mind just to start. A few things I want us to keep in mind. First of all, we're talking about a Christian marriage. A Christian marriage. That means that the power for living in obedience to what the scriptures teach us this morning doesn't come from yourself, it comes from Jesus. Do you get that? Don't take what I'm teaching you this morning and use it as a law to measure your marriage, to punish your spouse, to accuse one another of missing the mark, and then to exact your revenge. That's not how to use the passage that I'm teaching you this morning. The way to use the passage I'm teaching you this morning is in the context of a Christian marriage. Now, what's a Christian marriage? A Christian marriage is where two very, very flawed people live together for the glory of God in Jesus' power. A Christian marriage is where two Christians are. And what's a Christian? A Christian who is somebody who's said yes to following Jesus. A Christian is someone who understands grace. What's grace? Grace is ill-deserved favor. A Christian is someone who understands the bad news that we're all sinners. We've all missed the mark. We've missed the mark personally, and we've missed the mark in our marriages. We've all missed the mark. But the good news of the gospel is that something has been done for us, that God saves sinners, 
that Jesus Christ lived the life that we should have lived and died the death we deserve to die on the cross, the cross. God took our sin and he put it on Jesus and he punished him in our place so that we could be forgiven and, and have the gift of eternal life. And we receive that gift through faith by turning from our sin, our self-directed, self-willed lives, and trusting in Christ to live a Christ-directed, Christ-honoring, Christ-glorifying life by grace. A Christian marriage, a Christian marriage, that's what we're talking about this morning, a gospel-centered marriage. Now, do you understand the gospel? Have you trusted in Christ? If you haven't, oh, I wish you would this morning. Come up after the service. I'd be happy to assist you. Now, secondly, as I talk about marriage this morning, we're talking about a Christian marriage. We're talking about marriage governed by and directed by the Word of God, not by our culture. You are not going to have a successful, God-glorifying, Christ-honoring marriage by changing your relationship status on Facebook. That is not the foundation. You're not going to learn how to live a gospel-centered, God-glorifying, Christ-honoring marriage on TikTok. It's not going to happen. But you can... By building your life and your marriage over time on the Word of God, the Bible. The Bible teaches that the family is God's institution and the basic building block of human society. The family, marriage, husbanding, wifing. It's not man's invention, it's God's invention. He gave marriage as a gift to mankind. The family is God's institution and the basic building block of human society. And marriage is the permanent union of one man and one woman for life. And everything I've said in the last 45 to 90 seconds about the family and about marriage goes directly into the teeth of a gale force wind that our culture is blowing against family and against marriage. And so to live a Christian marriage and to live according to what the scriptures teach about marriage, will be difficult. It will be. Because it's difficult, we've all made mistakes. Every single one of us in here has made mistakes in our marriage. I have. You have. And we all suffer to some degree from the consequences of those mistakes. We've all messed up marriage but there's hope for all of us in the gospel we've all gotten marriage wrong but there's hope for us in the gospel in fact philippians 3 verses 13 and 14 brethren i don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet but one thing i do forgetting what lies behind And reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Hey, none of us can do anything about what lies behind us. Broken marriages, hurt relationships, shame, guilt. But we can all look to Christ for forgiveness, for a covering for our shame and for for help for our marriage from this day forward we can press on in our lives and in our marriages to lay hold of that for which Christ laid hold of us we've all gotten it wrong let's look to Jesus and let him help us begin to set it right and then lastly listen if you're here this morning and you're a single person If you're here this morning and you're a young person, 
I don't want you to check out this morning. I want you to listen. I want you to listen carefully. Because if you listen carefully, you'll hear about an amazing Savior, Jesus Christ, who loved you and gave himself for you. And you'll hear about the kind of person Jesus Christ can help you become, young person, the person Jesus Christ can help you become so that one day you'll be the best possible spouse. And if you'll follow Jesus, you'll know the kind of spouse to be looking for if, by God's grace, you're given the opportunity to marry. So single person, stay with me. Stay with me because you'll learn about Jesus and you'll learn about the kind of person Jesus wants to make you and the kind of person he may choose to give you in the future. So what are we going to learn? This morning we're going to learn that Jesus enables us to have a happily imperfect marriage. Now, I've been married for 26 years. Sue Ellen and I got married on May 4th, 1996. There it is. It's amazing. And listen, the one, this is one of the only things that I look back on my life and I go, man, Jesus, you're amazing. You gave me the gift of my wife, Sue Ellen. She is incredible. She has loved me so well for 26 years, and she has loved the church so well for 26 years. She has been an amazing partner in ministry. But I want you to know, we have a happy marriage. I love my wife, but we have a happily imperfect marriage. I mean, are you kidding me? She married me. We have a happily imperfect marriage. Listen, our house is a mess. Because I don't pitch in to help as much as I could. Listen, we have a happily imperfect marriage. We struggle to go on date nights. We've not once, never, we've never been on a marriage enrichment cruise. We've never once, not once, gone to a marriage conference. We have a happily imperfect marriage because of Jesus. Listen, we fight over money. We often get on the wrong side of arguments about our kids and their future. We don't always agree on everything. We spent 17 hours in the car this week driving to Birmingham and back. We have Waze, Google Maps, Siri, and in-car navigation. And we still argue over getting lost. This is true. We argue about where to go to dinner, on our way to dinner. We have a happily imperfect marriage. There is no one that I would want to do life and ministry with other than Sue Ellen. I can't look because I'll just, pastor cries a lot. PCA, it'll, it'll happen. So, Jesus enables us to have a happily imperfect marriage. So let's look at what this passage teaches us. First, look at verse 18 and verse 19, and there's two parties addressed in the verse, wives and husbands, not spouse and spouse, wives and husbands, not partner and partner, wives and husbands, two parties joined together in one union for life. A woman and a man, a wife and a husband, and each has a distinct role within the marriage relationship, and each one is made in the image of God, saved by grace, and enabled to live as a follower of Jesus with the full rights of adoption the full assurance of salvation, the gift of the Holy Spirit, both persons, the wife and the husband, are secure in their identity as a follower of Jesus and given unbelievably equal privileges as a Christian and access to God 
as a Christian, by grace, through faith, in the gospel, both people, the wife and the husband. And with all of that unity, there is diversity. There are distinct roles and distinct responsibilities for the wife and for the husband within the context of marriage. So what are they? Wives, verse 18 says, wives, be subject to your husbands. Get on the right page. Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Wives, be subject. Wives are invited by this passage to voluntary submission to their husbands. Let's look at the first word first, voluntary. You ever rubbed your fingernails on a chalkboard? It's horrible, right? It's a terrible sound. It's a terrible feeling. And when a husband demands submission from their wife on the basis of this passage, when a pastor demands submission from a woman to a man based on this, this passage, it should be just as grating. It's an abuse of power. It is not fitting with the gospel. It's not fitting with who Jesus Christ is. And this passage is not teaching men to demand submission from women in marriage. This passage is teaching that women are invited to voluntarily submit to Christ in obedience to him, in loving their husbands and following his loving leadership just as we follow Christ. Anything else any way that this passage is used to put women in a subjected position for the sake of control or power is anathema to the gospel. And it's not what this passage teaches. You with me? You hear me? Now so, it's voluntary. It's by grace. And it's submission. It's voluntary and its submission. The word for submission in Greek, the Bible was originally written in Greek, the New Testament, and the Greek word for submission is the word hupotasso. And it's a military word. It means the same thing as what happens in the chain of command when soldiers of a lower rank come and they line up with their commander. Now, what, could, what would happen in an army, if they went into battle without a command, without clear instructions, and, and without any clue as to what the objective was, it wouldn't work. It would be disaster. And so it is in marriage that we're invited to voluntarily submit. Wives are invited to voluntarily submit to their husbands as is fitting in the Lord, which means that that submission is a response to Jesus and his love, his love for them. It means accepting the loving leadership of your husband graciously. Submission means from your position, building up your husband, holding him up in prayer, loving him, encouraging him, affirming him. Encouraging him to become the loving leader that God intended for him to be. Proverbs 14.1 says, The wise woman builds her house, but the foolish woman tears it down with her own hands. The wise woman builds her house. This is not, it's not powerlessness. To be in a place of submission to your, your husband? It's not powerlessness, it's powerfulness. Power to build and encourage and pray for and support and come alongside your husband. It's the greatest gift that you could give him. Because a man's greatest need is 
is for significance, to feel worthwhile, to be respected. And when a wife respects her husband, she sets him free, free from shame, free in the gospel, pointing him to Jesus, free to be all that God wants him to be. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who shames him is as rottenness to his bones. When I was uh, eight years old, my, my mother passed away of cancer. And the way they discovered the cancer that had started with breast cancer when she was in her 20s before I was born, the way they discovered the cancer had spread and come back was she rolled over in bed, and when she rolled over in bed, she broke her leg. The cancer had become rottenness in her bones. Wives, don't be rottenness in your husband's bones. Instead, voluntarily, by grace, through faith in Jesus, love your husband's by supporting them, encouraging them, cheering them on toward all that God has invited them to be in Jesus Christ. Now, what about husbands? What are the keys to understanding the husband's role? Well, verse 19 says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Husbands, love your wives. The role of the husband is one of loving, servant, leadership. Loving, servant, leadership. Loving. Now, I told you the Bible, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. And when Paul's writing, he's writing, he's writing. Love. Hmm. What word should I use? We have one word in English. But he had so many words to choose from. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul doesn't write in the word that the culture around him would have chosen because they would have chosen the word eros, the word for romantic love. But Paul, when he writes about the love of husbands for wives, he writes agape, the word for sacrificial love, the word for self-sacrificing love. And we're jarred by verse 18. But the original readers of this passage would have been jarred by verse 19 because Paul goes directly against the culture and he says, not eros, not romantic love, not love that men want and are naturally bent to give, but a love that has to be by grace, that has to be supernaturally born, that men are not naturally driven and attracted to self-denying, sacrificial, agape love. The kind of love that God the Father has for us. The kind of love that Jesus Christ demonstrates for us. Where are we going to learn to live like that? Where are we going to learn to love like that? From Jesus. In John 13, on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he covered himself in a towel and And he washed his disciples' feet. And then in verse 15, he says, I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. What's agapao? It's the love of a Savior washing the filthy feet of his disciples. What's agapao? It's the love of our Savior hanging on a cross, naked on a garbage dump, having our sin put on him, being punished in our place, cut off from the Father because of our sin, bearing in himself the wrath of God against us. That's agapao. Love. Love, loving, servant leadership. Loving, servant leadership. We love 
We serve. And then we lead. You see, we didn't start with leadership. We didn't say that the role of men in the home is leadership. We said that the role of men in the home is loving, sacrificial, servant leadership. I get really nervous when I talk to people and they say, I should be the leader. I generally think that if someone says, I should be the leader, they're, not dis- they're immediately disqualified, or at least there should be a huge pause. <laughs> but when a person says, I- I- I'm not sure, I, I mean, I'm, I'm terrified. It's not a sign of a weak leader. It's a sign of a leader who understands themselves. Who understands that what leadership involves is agapao, sacrificial love. Who understands that leadership is not spelled P-O-W-E-R. Leadership is spelled (laughs) S-E-R-V-E. S-E-R-V-E. It's not spelled power. It's spelled serve. To lead is to serve. We don't ascend to greatness in the home or in the church. We descend to greatness in the home and in the church. That's why the prerequisites for leadership in the church begin in the home. You learn to lead in the church by leading well in your homes. You learn to lead well in your home by patterning your life after Christ, his agapao, his love, and his sacrificial service. And when you've descended to greatness in the home, now you're barely ready to start using the term for yourself as a husband that I'm the leader. Are you? If you've learned to love and if you've learned to serve, now you're beginning to learn to lead. Now, this is even more clear when we see what the opposite of loving sacrificial leadership is. What does Paul say is the opposite of loving, sacrificial leadership? He says it's bitterness. The word for bitterness is the word for pointedness, harshness. Don't be embittered. Don't be harsh. We're going to learn more about that next week when we talk about parenting and the roles of fathers towards their children. But listen to what John Calvin says about this passage. Colossians 3.19 requires love on the part of husbands and that they not be bitter because there is a danger lest they should abuse their authority in the way of tyranny. He's not talking about the civil government. He's not talking about the church. He's talking about husbands. He starts with the lowest level of leadership after self-leadership, leadership in the home. Don't give way to tyranny in the home, and you won't give way to tyranny in the church, and you won't give way to tyranny in the world, in the civil government. John uh, MacArthur, he says it even better. <laughs> you can't call your wife honey and then act like vinegar. Vinegar. Sue Ellen and I have a thing. Anytime I start a conversation with the words, hey, honey, it probably means I've spent more money than I should have on something. (laughs) And so every now and then I just say, hey, honey, and she holds on. I say, I love you. (laughs) You can't call her honey and then act like vinegar. Now, we've looked at the role of wives. What's the role of wives? Voluntary submission. We've looked at the roles of husbands. What's the roles of husbands? Loving, servant, leadership. Now, how do we take a step toward this this week? How do we take a step towards this this week? 
I want you to learn this morning three steps to enjoy a happily imperfect marriage. Three steps to enjoy a happily imperfect marriage. Wives, elbow your husbands. This is a great chance. Husbands, grab a pen. You want to write this down. Step one. Step one. Learn this. I didn't marry Jesus. <laughs> Step one. I didn't marry Jesus. Now, most of you probably learned this on the honeymoon. But for the rest of you, you didn't marry Jesus. That means two things. The first thing it means is this. I want you to know compatibility is a myth. It isn't real. Young people, if you start by saying, I'm going to wait for the one, Mr. Wonderful, Mrs. Wright, they're out there and I'm just going to wait for them. Listen, I grew up in the 80s. I grew up in some of the worstest, best romantic comedies ever made. 16 Candles. I was convinced one day I was going to be Jake. I was going to be standing next to my Porsche. And Samantha was going to come walking out. And I was going to be Prince Charming in my button down and my jeans and my penny loafers. I never came close to Jake. <laughs> Mr. Wonderful is not out there. Mrs. Wright is not out there. Compatibility is a myth. The second thing is this. If you didn't marry Jesus, if you didn't marry Jesus, don't look to your spouse to be Jesus. Don't look to your spouse to be your savior. Your spouse makes a very yucky savior. He or she will disappoint you because he or she isn't Jesus. There's one Jesus. There's one Savior. And that's good news. It's a good thing that there's a Savior. Because I'm a sinner and so are you. Isn't it good to have a Savior? Isn't it good to have someone who's done everything to make you beautiful, acceptable, right with God? Isn't that a good thing? Of course it is. There is a Savior. His name is Jesus. So let Jesus be the Savior and let your spouse be amazing, awesome, great. Grace will do amazing things in their life, but you'll short-circuit it if you ask them to be Savior. If you ask them to be Mrs. Wright or Mr. Wonderful, you didn't marry Jesus. Step one. Write it down. Step two. You're not Jesus. Now this takes us... Most people are very aware that everybody else isn't Jesus. But they hold on a little longer to the myth that they might be. You're not Jesus. You didn't marry Jesus, and you're not Jesus. That's step two. Step two, stop trying to be Jesus. Wives, voluntary submission doesn't mean holding up. I'm going to do it. No, it means letting Jesus... Be real in you and loving in his power, submitting in his power and his grace. You're not Jesus. Step three. Step three. I need Jesus. Don't you? Don't you need Jesus? to live a happily imperfect marriage to the imperfect person that you're married to as the imperfect person that you are? Don't you need Jesus? Don't you need Jesus to, to save you from your sin? Don't you need Jesus to give you his Holy Spirit so that you'd have a shot at, at loving and submitting, voluntarily submitting and loving and serving and leading well in your home? Don't you need Jesus? When you invite Jesus into the center of your life, when you invite Jesus into the center of your marriage, wives, you will have 
the security in Jesus that you need to have the guts, the courage to voluntarily submit to your husband, imperfect though he be. And men, when you take the gospel, when you take Jesus Christ into the center of your life, you will then have the identity you need to be able to love and serve and lead in a way that reflects who you now are in Jesus Christ. Many years ago, and back when dinosaurs roamed the planet, I got started in ministry. I remember my first wedding that I officiated. It was at uh, a golf course in uh, Pinehurst, North Carolina. Um, I, I was standing there looking very nice in my suit, and all of a sudden I hear this crack, crack, and a golf ball landed right at my feet. All throughout my ministry, I've always gone back to the Presbyterian Book of Common Worship and, and the exposition of marriage that they have in their Book of Common Worship. And I read this at every wedding that I officiate. And I just want to close our service by reminding you, if you're married, listen, this is, this is a beautiful, poetic exposition. Maybe you heard something similar to this at your wedding. Dearly beloved, we are assembled here in the presence of God to join this man and this woman in holy matrimony, which is instituted of God, regulated by his commandments, blessed by our Lord Jesus Christ, and to be held in honor among all men. Let us therefore reverently remember that God has established and sanctified marriage for the welfare and increase of mankind. Our Savior has declared that a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. By his apostles, he has instructed those who enter into this relation to cherish a mutual esteem and love, to bear with each other's infirmities and weaknesses, to comfort each other in sickness, trouble, and sorrow, in honesty and industry to provide for each other and for their household in temporal things, to pray for and encourage each other in the things which pertain to God, and to live together as heirs of the grace of life. Oh, dear people, let's learn to live by Jesus, by God's grace, let's let Jesus enable us to live in happily imperfect marriages. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being our groom, the one who laid down his life for his bride to make us white and spotless without blemish. We all wear white by grace, through faith in Christ. We, we all put on white, forgiven, without stain. Thank you. And if you've never put your trust in Christ, won't you this morning? You can do it right where you're seated, seating, seated now. Just say to Jesus, Jesus, I admit to you that, that I'm a sinner and I'm sorry. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross and rose from the dead for me. Jesus, come into my life as Savior. And come into my life as Master and Lord. And help me become the person you want me to be. And oh, Jesus, every single one of us have gotten marriage wrong in some way. We're children of divorce and parents of divorce. But Lord, by your grace, forgetting what lies behind and pressing on toward what lies ahead, Lord, would you help us to enjoy happily imperfect marriages in voluntary submission and loving servant leadership, all to the praise of your glory and grace. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.